Who are we? Avril Madrell, University of the West of England, Veronica Della Dora, University of Bristol, Heather Walton, University of Glasgow, and myself, Alessandro Scafi, the Warburg Institute, School of Advanced Study of the University of London. How important is landscape in the experience of a Christian pilgrim? We thought to explore this question. We looked at the significance of landscape in three pilgrimage sites. Meteora, a shrine in Greece, the Sacro Speco, the Holy Cave, a Benedictine monastery in central Italy, praying the keels, pilgrimage walks in the Isle of Man. Three different cases of pilgrimage within Christianity. The first belonging to the Orthodox Church, the second arising out of the Roman Catholic tradition, the third having a more ecumenical significance. What do these three sites have in common? Landscape. Landscape adding to the spiritual magnetism of the site. Landscape in Meteora, the rock pillars 100 meters high on which Byzantine monasteries are built. Landscape in Subiaco, the stunning setting of the monastery carved in the rock over the site, the cave of St. Benedict. Landscape in the Isle of Man, the remote coastal fringe of the island where medieval chapels were established. A landscape blending nature and culture, geography and history, the holy and the wild. A pilgrim travels to visit a place of worship. The pilgrim is focused on a locality, yet seeks an absolute. The pilgrimage takes place during a physical journey, is performed within a limited period of time, but the temporary state of being a pilgrim has precisely the function to activate a permanent condition of pilgrimage, has the function to unsettle the pilgrim, to settle the pilgrim in a stable state of instability. During the pilgrimage, the pilgrim learns to be constantly on the move, so that the whole of his life becomes a pilgrimage. To embark on a pilgrimage means to go on a physical road, to reach a sacred location, a holy place located somewhere on the physical plane, a holy place within. And we are interested in the role of landscape in all this, in how a beautiful landscape facilitates a more intense spiritual experience, how a state of the land becomes a state of mind, how God has been experienced through nature at our three sites, how both nature and the holy evoke a separation from the ordinary, how both produce wonder. No, we don't think it's a coincidence. It seems that amazing places attract amazing events. Stunning sights feed the afterlife of crucial happenings. What is the link between perceiving the presence of God in particular places and the natural features of those places? We think that landscape is an important identity marker for a holy site, and always a liminal landscape a landscape in between, between heaven and earth, between past and present, for both pilgrims and tourists. Take the Meteora. Meteora literally means suspended. Meteora are islands suspended in the air. Take Subiaco. Petrarch described the shrine stuck against the rock, Limen Paradisi, the edge of paradise. The humanist Pope Pius II compare it to a swallow's nest. Take the Isle of Man, the pilgrim there tours the chapels, keels in Man's Gaelic, sites established by medieval hermits, and in doing so, he or she enjoys beautiful scenery and landscape. We've noticed that in our three sites, the two categories of pilgrims and tourists blur. These sites are holy, but also very popular tourist attractions. Sites where pilgrims search an encounter with the divine, the absolute other. Sites where tourists 
such an encounter with the cultural, the natural other. But both, pilgrims and tourists, share a desire to break from the everyday, an urge to access something unique, and landscape plays a significant role for both. The goal of the pilgrim is to access a place that has become sacred. A place which was ordinary, but where the sacred has manifested in some way and therefore is no longer ordinary, it has become something else, completely different, though remaining itself still part of its surrounding milieu. The pilgrim looks for the same transformation. We have explored the ways in which pilgrims have experienced the landscape of our three sides, overwhelming landscapes. Think of Meteora, of Subiaco, perfect places to meditate, high spots from which you can look at the world, put it into perspective, raise above the earth, look at your life from a distance. And we have explored the links between pilgrimage and tourism. Perhaps our Western world is not as secular as generally assumed. By definition, holy places are set apart from the world, by coastlines, by some border, by altitude. To reach such a higher ground, pilgrimage requires a, a labour or spiritual detachment, as well as the challenges of a material journey. And this is how the holy and the wild blend into one another. The pilgrim searches for a holy place. The holy place marks the spot, records the moment, when the divine dimension has erupted into the human world. A holy place for a holy moment. This is what the pilgrim finds. This is what the pilgrim remembers, reenacts, the original event taking place at the holy site. This is what the pilgrim rediscovers, the experience of the divine that originated there, that is made present to him or to her now. The pilgrim journeys to Meteora to be inspired by the site where the Holy Fathers had a glimpse of heaven. The pilgrim prays in Subiaco in the Holy Cave where Saint Benedict lived as a hermit for three years, hoping to enjoy the same encounter with God that Saint Benedict experienced on that very spot. In the Isle of Man, the pilgrim walks for a week in May among the ruins of medieval chapels to engage with all sites of worship. But in this way, the pilgrim is brought to a dimension beyond that particular place, beyond that particular moment, beyond time and space. In this way, the pilgrim remembers the past. The pilgrim remembers the future. The pilgrim reenacts the past in the future. Who goes on a pilgrimage? In Meteora, devout Orthodox. Nuns, monks, priests, but also tourists, local visitors, casual visitors. In the Isle of Man, Christians of all denominations pray the keels. Locals and visitors enjoy the site to have a break. Virtual pilgrims access the site through DVDs. I've done my own research in Subiaco. There, the first to seek out Benedict's cave were shepherds, the inhabitants of the neighboring regions. Names. Among the most recent popes, John Paul II, Paul VI, John XXIII. In a more distant past, Innocent III, who gave gifts, privileges to the monasteries. Pius II, many others. Cardinals, Ratzinger, for instance. Royals, from England, from Spain, from Italy. Ambassadors, scholars. Signatures from the visitors' books include art historian Federico Hermanin, ethnographer Luigi Pigorini, composer of Torino Respighi, visitors from France, from Ireland, from Canada, common people, children, a friar who sketched the raven which took the poisoned bread away from Benedict, seminarians who drew a chalice with a snake, the poisoned chalice that shattered when Benedict prayed a blessing over it, common people writing poems to praise the holiness of the site.
in the Bible, in Christian tradition, rocks, in particular caves and grottos, have always played a significant role. In the Isle of Man, the keels are structure of stones. In Meteora, the monastery are set on top of spectacular stone pillars. Cliffs emerging from the plain, majestic, with all sorts of shapes. There are huge obelisks of rock, a forest of rocks. And the rocks inspire the pilgrim. Ages pass, the rocks remain. Like the rock, the spirit remains. It is the rest that goes. Likewise in Subiaco, with the grotto of St. Benedict. And the Latin inscription carved in the rock at the entrance of the monastery addresses Benedict and the pilgrim entering the site. Continue in the darkness to seek the shining light. Only on a dark night do the stars shine. Only on a dark night do the stars shine.